Pagu, Chapter 9. In, out, up with traveling towers. Remember, at the end of last chapter, Pugu got swallowed by a fish, along with the hermit crab lady and the whole shell and everybody else in the traveling towers. I'm a little anxious to see what's going to happen here. So there is a picture of the fish as it's going to swallow that hermit crab with all the other things on it. The fish who had swallowed Pagarus, along with his landlady, five barnacles and seven shells of Traveling Tower, was Big Head the Sculpin. He came and went with the tides, and you could just not see him. His huge head and mottled body were spiked and fringed with floppy, mossy parts. When he lingered near rocks or pebbly bottoms or shriveling seaweed, his color changed to fit the scenery, and you could not see which was which. If he did not move, well, he could not be there. But just when you thought he was not there, then Big Head ate you. Sculpins had been skulking around like this for a long time. A sculpin was one of the big dangers of a tide pool living. He was to be learned about and forgotten, except deep inside with nerves all set for getaway action whenever he might appear. So nobody worried. Many timid creatures lived in the sea, and most of them have their enemies, but always enough of them survived to carry on. Pagu had been swallowed. Just like that. However, luck was with him. The sculpin was not feeling well this morning. Big Head had charged a sea hare, and its powerful purple cloud had bounced him back like a blow in the face. He skulked in the weeds, still hungry. Then he spied traveling tires and the landlady. Fresh hermit, and fresh barnacles, too. He would digest them all and later toss out the empty shells. He charged with mouth wide open. Ugh, what a rough lump. He dashed near the shore and heaved out traveling towers. In other words, he threw up. Had this been a lesson to Bagu, what lesson can be learned in the very jaws of death? Old Ingsen had gone deathly silent. What was there left to say? Pagu was confused. No part of this had been his fault. At times, some misfortune gulps you down, and you learn only one small thing. Pagu had learned to be aware of such creatures as sculpins, and maybe this one lesson was quite enough for now. Phew! I was a little worried about poor Pagu and that fish. The landlady had been as confused as Pagu. She had not seen Big Head coming, and when it was too late, well, it was too late. But the horny-headed fish had not held traveling towers for long. The landlady felt peculiar vibrations as Sculpin's front fins jerked, his tail lashed madly, carrying them on. Then violent shudders, and all the passengers suddenly were ungulped not far from shore. The landlady was galloping when she hit the tide pool bottom, and she did not stop. She would get away from where Sculpin's cruised. At the very edge of the pool, she backed her apartments beneath a ledge where Big Head could not come. What an awful experience! The barnacles may have felt likewise, but they gave no signs. Everyone cleaned legs and feelers, and all hands of traveling towers sunk into deep sleep, exhausted. Pagu awoke first and noticed it, no water for breathing. Old Pal yelled, for oxygen, and Pagu poked his head out the door and into dry rock. Backing underneath the ledge, the landlady had squeezed Pagu's room against the cave roof. He couldn't get out. The landlady awoke and noticed the changes. She shuddered. Was she still inside the sculpin? No, her feet were near seawater, seawater growing stale and saltier as it dried up in a pool, shallow shore pool at low tide. Shore? Low tide? She leaped forward, half out of her shell. Her feelers waved in empty air. Traveling towers were stranded. She must move. She couldn't budge her house. Tug and strain as she might, she had done her job too well when scrambling under the rock. Traveling towers were stuck above water. Pagu's penthouse was barely damp from the wash of the last low ripple. The landlady had not known Pagu very well, if at all, but she could feel him rattling around upstairs, banging his fists on the walls. She had a hazy idea that he wanted to get out of there. Well, so did she. A clamor of curlews, sandpipers, and gulls told that these birds were raiding the beach for tidbits left by the tide. Curlews walking. There are some of the little curlews walking 
And there are some of the seagulls flying. And there's a seagull after everybody. With stately steps, ran their down curved beak into holes after hiding squirming food. Sandpiper scuttled across the wet beach like sandy shallows. Gulls found clams and flapped and screamed with joy. Each clam tried to dig deeper into wet sand. Its narrow foot poked down and swelled up like a ball. The clam pulled its shell-covered body down to the ball anchor. The faster it poked, balled up, and pulled, the faster it sank in the sand. But gulls are quick, and many clams were caught. When a clam was dragged out, it tucked in its foot in its twin tubes for feeding and breathing and snapped its door. Inside muscles pull, put on pressure, hugging the doors together. A gull caught a clam in its beak, flew high with it, and let go. The clam fell, turning over and over, struck a rock, and almost seemed to explode. The gull swooped after it to feed on clam meat. Another gull, gull soared up, dropped its clam, not on a rock, but on hard sand, and still the clam broke open. Because of the tension of the pulling muscles, the shell of the clam scattered inward with the blow. Meanwhile, the landlady of Traveling Towers was doing a desperate thing. Quick as a flash, she popped from her shell, spun around, clutched her apartment house. This way, she tugged with her claws. She pushed, pulled, and twisted. She was so anxious to loosen the thing that she got her tender, unprotected rear. The landlady's eyes were sharp, and she saw the gull descending. Let everything go, she backed in her shell and clapped her glove door shut. She did it all in one movement, as though she were a toy snapped in by a rubber band. The hungry gold teetered on slippery stones, hunched over, and peered beneath the ledge. A fat hermit was somewhere in that barnacle lump. He had seen her herself. She was one mouthful he was going to get. He gripped the rough lamp of shells, and with his beak, and wrenched it loose, up into the sky he flew with traveling towers. Chapter 9 